the distinguished guest speaker and awardee Dr. Sushmita Kaushik, the respected founder chairman of this great institution Dr. Jian Rao, the distinguished scientist director emeritus Professor Brian Holden, I Research Center, Dr. D. Bal Subramaniam, Dr. Prashant Garg, Executive Chairman, Mr. Mahavir and his team, esteemed professors and officials of LB Prasad Hospital, my fellow Rotarians, Rotary Ants, and guests, and Rotarians from other clubs. It gives me immense joy to be in your midst in this pre prestigious institution. Dr. Rustam Ranji, Award Lecture is an annual joint event of the Rotary Club of Hyderabad and LB Prasada Institute. I think that it is important that I say at the very outset a few words about Rotary and the service that Rotarians are rendering the community world over. Rotary is a global network of about 1.3 million neighbors, friends, leaders and problem solvers who see a world where people unite and take action to create lasting change across the globe in our communities and in ourselves. We Rotarians provide service to others, promote integrity and advance world understanding, goodwill and peace through our fellowship of business, professional and community leaders. Rotary International is primarily responsible for having eradicated polio almost entirely from the face of the earth. The Rotary Foundation is today the biggest charitable foundation of the world. Founded in 1905 with just five, four members, Rotary has today 35,000 Rotary clubs spread across 200 countries and geographical locations. Every Rotary club is a unit of Rotary International. The Rotary Club of Hyderabad, which is one such unit, was founded in 1949 with 50 members. It is the first Rotary Club of Twin Cities of Hyderabad and Sikandrabad. Many eminent personalities and leaders drawn from different walks of life have addressed our clubs. We are indeed fortunate to have got a highly enlightened ophthalmologist to deliver Dr. Rustam Ranji's Rotary Award Lecture this year. I am grateful to Dr. Sushmita Kaushik for accepting our invitation and our accepting the award. She has chosen a very relevant and important topic for the lecture. The importance of maturing child's health and in particular the eyesight cannot be overemphasized. Like all of you, I am also eagerly looking forward to hear her lecture on childhood glaucoma miles to go. I am sure that after listening to the learned speaker, we Rotarians may find an opportunity to do something to prevent and cure childhood glaucoma because we the Rotarians are a bridge between the problems and the possibilities. Take great pleasure in welcoming the awardee Dr. Sushmita Kaushik and every one of you and each one of you present here and gracing this occasion. Thank you. Now I call Rotarian Balraj Virmani for four waiters. I will mesh the Indian philosophy with the Western philosophy and quote the management guru Peter Drucker, who is a well-known management guru, and he has been to India a number of times. And he says, uh, starts with theory of karma. He says your karma in this life will determine your future, not only in next life, but this life itself. Now he says, this applies to management principle also, as well as to your life. If you mismanage manage the, yourself and the organization today, then you and your organization will continue to suffer forever. Thank you. Rotary, the four-way test of the things we think, say, and do. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Thank you. My sister, Dr. Malik Fernandez, the director of LBPI, 
to brief about the BPI and its historical changes. So it gives me great pleasure to stand before all of you. Um, thanks to the Rotarians, and we are commemorating Dr. Rustam Ranji. Um, I'm going to talk about L.V. Prasad Institute. We just completed the 35th anniversary of the L.V. Prasad Institute. It was founded by Dr. Golapalli Nageshwar Rao, June 1, uh, 1987. And um, since then, as you all know, we have, uh, you know, uh, covered a lot, achieved a lot. And uh, we are spread out over four states in over 260 locations. And the hallmark of what we've built today is actually the pyramidal model that I'm sure many of you would have heard about, where uh, at the base of the pyramid, our strength lies in the vision centers that we have. And uh, these would cater to a population of about 50,000. Uh, 10 of these clusters of vision centers would actually be uh, you know, servicing a secondary center. And the secondary center is manned by a single ophthalmologist with a staff of about 25 to 30 people. And uh, they would take care of the common uh, problems that we find mostly related to cataract and other minor surgeries. And we have 22 of these secondary centers which are located in these uh, four states. And uh, we have also taken care of our patients closer to the doorstep because we now have faculty from the various tertiary centers who actually deliver super specialty eye care to patients who cannot travel uh, to these uh, to the centers of excellence as well as the tertiary center. So we are performing corneal transplants, we are doing lasers, we are even doing pediatric, corneal, uh, pediatric surgeries at these secondary centers. So in an attempt to make sure that, um, you know, so that all may see and that no patient is denied care that they rightly deserve. So um, as you realize, nothing changes if nothing changes. And so Dr. Rao, after several years of of uh, you know manning the helm so to speak um, he you know through a very elaborate process which lasted over two years uh, s you know kind of narrowed down to Dr. Prashant Garg as the executive chair with uh, Rajiv as the vice chair and the rest of us as there are 12 of us who form the senior leadership group <laughs> with that uh, what we've done is kind of you know we've kind of uh, divided our roles and responsibilities but if you look at what's happened even though the pandemic brought us down we bounce back with the resilience. And uh, in the last year, just 21, 22, we've seen over 1 million uh, outpatients and done 140,000 surgeries across the network. Uh, one of the hallmarks is the fact that we have rehabilitation within the center itself. So for those who have visual impairment which cannot be taken care of uh, by any surgery or by any other means, those are taken care of in our rehabilitation service itself. And uh, we've uh, treated about 17 of those patients, been able to bring them back to, society, to the society, empower them. And um, in addition to that, community eye care is something that we are very proud of. We've seen over 200,000 patients in the community. And uh, the other thing that we introduced in the pandemic was tele-ophthalmology. So when everybody was scrambling to find a way to see doctors, within a couple of weeks, we were able to establish a very good tele-ophthalmology program called the Connect Care, which enabled the doctors to reach out to their patients who were not able to reach them. And um, so in just one year, we have seen over eight, 89,000 patients with teleophthalmology, helping patients in the far corners of the country who've not been able to come to the center. And we do that as, as a kind of a primary kind of a service, but then ultimately for uh, uh, eye surgeries, they would require to come to us. Uh, training has also been one of our fortes, as well as the very strong iBank network that we have, which is located in the four tertiary centers. And we've collected over 9,000 corneas in the past one year and utilized 7,000 of them. So 7,000 people who've been, who are corneally blind have had their vision restored with this or infection cured uh, with the corneas that we've harvested. And then of, uh, we have uh, received 125 awards and um, published over 500 uh, manuscripts in peer-reviewed journals in the last one year itself. But there are several new initiatives that have been taken, one of which is known as the Silver Sight Initiative or our home care. So we realize that it's very difficult for some of our patients to reach us. And that's where we thought that within a 10 kilometer radius, if it's possible, we'd like to reach out to our patients. And we started home-based home eye care services. Uh, it started initially in Bhubaneswar, also available in uh, Hyderabad, and is uh, set to take off um, in a big way very soon. Other than that, we have set up advanced eye cancer facilities in Vijaywada, as well as a diagnostic center in uh, Hyderabad. And uh, we've also set up three city centers in Hyderabad itself, which is going to help us to deliver care to patients who cannot actually travel. The traffic here obviously is a killer, as you all would know. And so to make it a little easier for our patients, we've, uh, we've kind of established these three city centers in Alwal, Madhapur, and Kismatpur. 
So for elderly patients, which is a very vulnerable group, we have care for both uh, age groups, that is pediatric patients are vulnerable and elderly patients are equally vulnerable. So the first center for elderly eye care that was established was in, in Vishakhapatnam at the GMRV campus, that is LV Prasad Institute in Vishakhapatnam. And recently we've opened up a center here in Hyderabad, which is known as a Gland Pharma Center for Elderly Eye Care, uh, which caters towards, uh, you know, septuagenarians and beyond, where we try and provide a holistic care for these patients. Uh, like I mentioned, we have inaugurated the centers in Alwal and one more interesting uh, thing that's happened was the establishment of this diagnostic van. So we have a mobile vehicle which is called Pashyantu. Pashyantu is equipped with diagnostic equipments and it goes out into the secondary centers. So we can't provide all the state-of-the-art diagnostic facilities in some of our secondary centers. So this vehicle is equipped with certain diagnostic equipments which will help the doctors in those secondary centers deliver better care to the patients there. So the vehicle moves around in Telangana. We have another vehicle in Andhra and one more in Orissa as well. And uh, recently, the Bajaj group came forward to inaugurate the, um, you know, the Retina Institute. It's named after Anand Bajaj, who passed away a couple of years ago. And uh, it's, it aims to provide, um, you know, um, or make the Retina Service an institute of excellence and a global resource center. So this is going to take care of Retina across the network. Besides that, uh, LVP also has done pretty well in the national rankings with four, all four of the tertiary centers uh, featuring in the top 15 of the week Hansa research survey for best ophthalmology hospitals in the country. But keeping all that in mind, what we actually, what is the core of what we do lies in these five values that uh, of patient first excellence, ensuring that we follow the highest standards in everything that we do, ensuring that we maintain equity irrespective of the patient's ability to pay or not, regardless of their background, we try and treat everybody the same way. And integrity is also an important part of our DNA, as well as trying to remain together. So right from the base of the pyramid to the center of excellence, togetherness is one of the values that we try to embody. So with that, I'd like to thank you all, especially the Rotarians, for instituting this, uh, this lecture and uh, which we has been going on for several years and we have a stellar speaker here today so uh, thank you very much and thank you all for being here hi good evening uh, a few lines of the rotary club of hyderabad this is this is the premier and oldest rotary club in the twin cities of hyderabad and sikandarabad it was granted charter on december 31st 1949 the charter president was the illustrious Nawab Zain Yar Jang Bahadur, while the charter secretary was Dr. K. Ram K. Bhandari. Our members are drawn from different walks of life and comprise doctors, lawyers, chartered accountants, businessmen from small and large communities. Our aim is to achieve better success in our own four avenues of service, namely club service, vocational service, community service and international service. We have had the former Prime Minister Sri P. V. Narsimha Rao inaugurate our Golden Jubilee celebrations some time back. Our club has been involved in activities to serve the communities. To mention a few, the Konya Preservation Center at the LV Prasad Institute, uh, world -class with world class facilities, adoption of a school at a nearby village called Jagannagoda near where toilets, drinking water, buildings, classroom and equipment have been provided, regular and continued assistance for home for the aged, Mother Teresa's home for the dying destitutes, career guidance seminars for school children, houses for Lato earthquake victims, and recently blankets for the earthquake victims of Gujarat, donations for, pre for provision of artificial limbs, a major product project of immunization of one lakh children in government schools against hepatitis B, provision of sanitation and drinking water, regular health camps in rural areas, vocational excellence awards, <coughs> distinguished citizens awards, scholarships to poor students, midday meals, schemes, career exhibitions, donations to poor schools, provision of school benches, etc. These are a few of our achievements. The Rustam Ranji Award. The late Dr. Rustam Ranji one of Hyderabad's leading practitioners was honorary ophthalmologist to the former Nizam and consultant to the state and central railways, Indian Airlines and KEM Hospital, Mumbai. Dr. Rustam Ranji was associated with several charitable institutions, 
particularly the Institute for Blind. He was a chartered member and former president of the Rotary Club of Hyderabad. When he passed away in 1973, he bequeathed a generous legacy to the Rotary Club. The Rotary Club of Hyderabad, in order to perpetuate his memories, set up a corpus fund for L.V. Prasad I Institute in 1997-98 and instituted an award for, the, for an outstanding scientist. This lecture is sponsored by the Rotary Club of Hyderabad each year in Dr. Rustam Ranji's memory. Thank you. Dr. Sirisha Sentil to introduce the award to Dr. Good evening, uh, Rotarians and friends. It gives me great pleasure in inviting my dear friend Sushmita Kaushik, uh, who's been awarded uh, today's and this year's Rotary lecture. So to tell briefly about Sushmita, I would say she breathes, eats, and lives pediatric ophthalmology, or she takes care of kids with glaucoma. So that's what she specializes in. Uh, she did her ophthalmology from uh, Maulana Azad Medical College, New Delhi, after which she completed her senior residency at uh, PGI Chandigarh Advanced Eye Care Center uh, in 2004. And currently, she's the professor of ophthalmology at uh, JIPMER and also, uh, sorry, PGI MER and heads the teaching program at the institute. Uh, Sushmita so specializes, like I said, in childhood glaucoma. Also, she has keen interest in uh, newer diagnostic technologies and tries to put together a lot of clinical applications with what we learn. And a lot of new information comes out uh, from the work that her group does, which is, which is very, very rewarding, not just for um, the group of people in India, but across the world. Uh, she is also the founder secretary of the Indian Pediatric Glaucoma Society, vice president of the Chandigarh Ophthalmological Society, and former secretary of Glaucoma Society of India. She has several publications, over 170 at, and counting, and uh, in the national and international journals, and authored several books. And um, she is uh, a reviewer for several reputed journals in ophthalmology. And she's been ordered, uh, or, uh, honored with numerous recognitions and scientific awards. And to name a few, both in Indian and international, so Glaucoma Society of India, All India, uh, Society of uh, Ophthalmological Services, UK Pediatric Glaucoma Society, and several others. Music is her passion, and uh, also theater. So she has two lovely children, where she actually uh, is very proud of their achievements. And you should say, apart from doing all that she does, she's a great mom. Thank you, Sushmita. And we invite you for the lecture today. Well, at the outset, um, thank you. Thank you, Rotarians. Um, I'm most humbled, I'm honored, and I'm privileged to be here, to be the recipient of this. Um, my thanks goes out to Dr. Prashant Gar, Dr. Shubho, Sirisha, my dear friend, Dr. Merle, and uh, everybody who's thought that our work is uh, worthy of this, uh, this wonderful privilege today. So thank you very much. <laughs> So, um, as Sirisha said, once you're a mom, you see your child in every baby that comes to you. And uh, I remember we were together at the UK Pediatric Glaucoma Society, and uh, Dr. Elizabeth Werner, a very, very well-known uh, pediatric ophthalmologist, was just standing and looking out at uh, the attendees and the faculty. Uh, Sirisha and I asked her, what are you looking at? She says, just turn around and see the number of women who are here today. So she says, what does that mean? So he says, it means that the women aren't afraid to do the hard work with no returns. <laughs> so, so that's probably one reason why so many of us who deal with children are also those who've had children of our own. Right, so um, uh, Dr. Merle asked me to talk about the known and the unknown. Believe me, 
most is unknown and the little that we know we try to to do whatever we can to make these children a uh, little better uh, of course we are uh, remembering dr rustam ranji and uh, in his honor so i dedicate this lecture to him and his memory as well um there are no financial disclosures and we've taken informed consent from all the parents because i always feel that uh, rather than giving scientific if we give a human side and we realize that these children are all part of families part of uh, people who are in trouble it makes it better but then i do need to show their faces then so we take consent for that and at the outset before i start i must also say that uh, the privilege of presenting and the intimidation of presenting in front of our guru uh dr anil mandal because he is the one who's really um, started this journey of pediatric glaucoma where we are concerned he'll always say that it was his mentor professor anand sood but ever since we've been born into ophthalmology childhood glaucoma equaled dr anil mandal and lv prasad eye institute so for me personally it's a great great honor to be presenting in front of him thank you sir for all your for all you've taught us right so um coming to the magnitude of childhood blindness the prevalence ranges from about 0.1 to 1.1 every 1000 children and remember this is a lifetime of blindness and in india it's about 0.5 per 1000 children born so why bother because one would say in all this big population the numbers are less but if you look at it in perspective it's the second largest cause of blind person years after cataract which means the number of years that a that a person has to live with that blindness and that is second only to cataract so when you look at it in this perspective that if a if a one year old baby goes blind there is 70 or 80 blind years that is adding to the community and to the country and society so that's where early intervention and all that all those who of us who work with children have to realize and we do realize that and we do that so strangely the worldwide recognition of the importance of childhood glaucoma is rather recent and even the world glaucoma association only had a consensus meeting as early i would say as june 2013 and we've all been a part of that but congenital glaucoma or developmental glaucoma or childhood glaucoma was one basket into which all these children used to be dumped and everybody and anybody was thought to have the same disease and were treated the same way and then some did well some didn't do well so then that's too bad and that was that until the world glaucoma association actually actually i think has woken up and and now the world is looking at the fact that childhood glaucoma is a, is a completely different disease to reckon with with lots and lots of nuances within so the uk pediatric glaucoma society led by this is uh, sir professor uh, peng ko he was the first who has actually instituted a pediatric glaucoma society and this was the only one in the world and this is the inspiration from which we then together and it, in fact it was here in this auditorium the first indian pediatric glaucoma society meeting we are a registered society now and uh, we had that meeting and again just look at the number of women so so elizabeth's uh, uh, observation was correct but uh, we are we are a young fledgling society and growing but uh, the idea is to focus attention and focused care for children with glaucoma so um, i'll just uh, put together what is glaucoma anyway it's progressive damage to the optic nerve now the optic nerve can be akin to the cable from a camera to a cpu so that cable is from the eye to the brain and the brain is our cpu and the eye is just the camera so it's not the eye that doesn't see so much in glaucoma as much as the optic nerve and then what happens in glaucoma is that just like the wire can get frayed and the signals won't reach the cpu similarly the optic nerve can get damaged and then the signals from the eye is not going to reach the brain so that's that in in a nutshell is what glaucoma is all about and the consequence is something like this so this is somebody who would be in a busy street with normal vision and yet if you have glaucoma this is what happens your fields constrict and this is called a field where you know the sides also in addition to the front so that constricts and you could have these things called scotomas or black spots in the areas where your retina is damaged 
So the consequence of that is uh, the, the person, if it's untreated and unmanaged, they eventually go blind. And if this happens in a small baby, then the baby is going to be blind for life. So the treatment aims to reduce the risk of further optic nerve damage by reducing the pressures. So that can be done by medication or surgery, but for small children and small babies, the main problem, the main um, uh, thing that we do is surgery to reduce the pressure. So why is the problem so different? Childhood glaucoma is potentially blinding and our job doesn't end with IOP control, the intraocular pressure control, because it's a growing, developing eye which hasn't developed as yet. So all our babies and all our children are actually developing until about 12 years or 13 years of age. And then in that developing eye, if you have a disease like glaucoma, it's double whammy. Because even if you've got the pressure down and you're not taking care of the rest of the visual pathway or the rest of the problem, then these children are not going to do so well. So for instance, in this newborn, we treat the, the uh, disease, we operate, the pressure comes down and you have this thing called the cornea where it is still white. Now if you're going to leave this child and say I treated the glaucoma because the pressure is normal but at the end of the day the child isn't going to see so the child needs something like a corneal transplant so you know so many people come into the to the uh, rescue of these children that we really really need to work together and have people with pediatric cornea, pediatric retina, pediatric glaucoma working together to ensure that the child has a clear media that's what we say and the light can go in so you can understand if the camera's lens is going to be cloudy it doesn't matter if you have a first class film behind but the light is not going to reach so that's that's an example of what so what are the challenges they're difficult to examine because then we don't know what they have because everybody looks the same all the babies look like white corneas and big eyes it's a surgical disease and surgery is difficult in small elastic eyes the post-operative follow-up, you can't make the baby sit on your slit lamp, so they need general anesthesia, repeated general anesthesia in small children is a challenge, is a problem. And the one glaucoma where, like I said, the goal isn't target IOP, it's target vision. You need to have a vision of the child. And then there are complex problems. It's a whole family, there's genetics, there are other siblings, and then there's life itself of the child. So it's just not that. Now coming to difficult to examine, if you're, and we've realized that, if you have friends with the children and we make friends with them, you can do pretty much what you could do with an adult if they're a little old enough. So you have these two, three-year-olds where we take their pressures, we do their gonioscopy, we look into their eyes, into the retina. By the time they're about five or six years, we put them on visual field machines. Nowadays with uh, video games, it's easy to tell them you need to press the button and they learn very fast, let me tell you. And um, so, um, and then we also, also need to get their vision in. So playing with them and having fun in the clinic makes them your friends and you can um, examine quite a bit. But for the small children, we do things like, uh, we, we use a camera, I use a camera very often because you just take one picture and then you look at your digital camera and you know what they have because they're not going to show you on the slit lamp. So that's the sort of slit lamp or dilated exam that we see. And once we look at what they have, this term childhood glaucoma is a potpourri of many, many, many conditions. Each one of them is a different challenge and requires different treatments. So um, the first thing, of course, is to recognize the problem. I wish every newborn could come and raise its hand and say, look, hey, listen, I have glaucoma, but that's not what happens. So uh, you need to know who has childhood glaucoma. You need to know what is the problem. You need to know how early it can develop, what options do we have, and then even after management, what next? So it is like an ocean. It's very similar on the surface with countless myriad hues beneath. So underneath this placid, same looking congenital glaucoma, you have these many, many different things, different children, different diseases. For instance, I'll just, I'll just give examples of a few. This is something called an Axenfeld Riga. If you didn't, so this is a camera picture, this, that one. So if you didn't look into the eye, you wouldn't know what they have. And if you didn't know what they have, you wouldn't look at other things. So they have redundant teeth, they have periumbilical hernias, sometimes they have redundant skin. So looking at the child and knowing what they have is important in looking at the child holistically and they also run in families. So this girl we have treated and then you just ask that one question, does anybody else in your family has law? I don't know, but my father doesn't see too well and my grandfather is blind. 
and when we get everybody in, all of them have Axenfeld rigor. It's just that the grandfather in childhood said, oh, to Andha hai, he's blind. The father said, oh yeah, you have some low vision, let me do some surgery. He had some surgery when he was about 20 years old. But they recognized that and when the little girl was brought in when she was two or three, she has 6 6 vision and goes to school. So they run in families. This is another mother. Because she had low vision and she knew there was a problem, she brought the child in, a mother, and you can see how similar they look. They both have Axenfeld Rieger. So knowing what they have is as important as doing whatever you want to do later just because they have glaucoma. Another example, aniridia, we call this an autosomal dominant disease, which means either of the parent can pass it on to all of their children. So this is a dad with aniridia who's passed it on to both his sons. And this is a mom with aniridia who's passed it on to one daughter and two sons as well. So when it's a dominant, so if you know that, so the minute you see aniridia, you call the whole family in and you call the siblings in. And then they'll say, no, nee, theke, theke. Say, nee, you call them in. Because there might be lurking things and they are, which would go unnoticed unless you looked for them. Another thing we've learned is congenital primary aphe. Aphe care means absence of the lens and the lens is required for a development of a whole lot of anterior segment or the, or the structures of the eye. And this is a very, very high frequency ultrasound which is called UBM, the ultrasound biomicroscopy, which shows this is absolutely empty and there's nothing here, so there's no lens. And we've learned to recognize it by this silvery hue and um, I, I would thank Dr. Uh, Murli. Dr. Murli, who's taught us this and whose work, uh, from whose work we've learned to recognize this condition and not do incisional surgery because these children's eyes would invariably be lost and it goes into something called thysis, it just goes in. So we have lost a couple of eyes before we knew, so this is the characteristic thing. So these are things, why I'm bringing this in is important to know what they have rather than just think that they all have congenital or childhood glaucoma. Once you know what they have, then your treatment and your, your management is very, very different. So all these children need is AFAK glasses, which means glasses, plus 10 glasses or plus 12 glasses to take care of not having the lens. If at all the pressures arrive, we do something called a laser, which is under transillumination because it is such a disorganized globe that we don't really know where to put the laser in. But So that's important. So where does genetics come in? Um, this is another... <laughs> A story where destiny, uh, they try to change destiny and it doesn't. So a small, I'll take just one minute. So these two are parents and they come in with this one first, so operated. And then the next one also has glaucoma, again operated. And then this gentleman comes in with this girl one day. Uh, who are you? Uh, I am the mama. You are the mama, which means uncle. Okay. And uh, where is the parents? Um, uh, they aren't there. They're sitting outside. Okay. And then the parents come in with this little fellow, again with glaucoma. So what are you doing? And who is this? No, this is theirs. But the minute she was born, she was given away to the mama because they thought this is a third child with glaucoma and we can't do it. And this girl is completely normal. So they've given away the normal kid thinking that, oh, another childhood glaucoma, let's try for a son. And then they have a son who has neonatal onset glaucoma. So don't dabble with destiny. You don't know what you're going to land. Anyway, thankfully, the whole family is together. So all four children come to us. And out of them, this one is still normal, the one which has a new dad. And the others have three children with glaucoma to deal with. Anyway, don't forget infections. In our country, we've learned to recognize this. Uh, intrauterine rubella infections causes cataract and glaucoma. Glaucoma is not usually recognized. Why that is important is if you recognize, now this is a typical, I call it a monkey baby. That's what they look like, small, small eyes, small head, uh, triangular chin, face. So this is a typical rubella baby. And if you know that this is rubella, you will look for a cataract. You will look for ear defects, but more importantly, you look for heart defects. So the three things that rubella infection um, affects is the eye, the ear, and the heart. But if you just go around treating the glaucoma in this, you'll miss the cataract. You won't send the child to a cardiologist. You won't send the child for so. A lot of these children are taken to be developmentally impaired, but the poor guys just need a hearing aid. They're not impaired. They can't hear, right? So when we recognize them and we send them over, it's so much more better for the babies as well. 
So this is uh, something which we did with uh, Dr. Sirisha. So I've just told her that we'll share this. Um, uh, this is what the IPGS did in 2019. And we found these were the different types of glaucoma. So I've just put that in. So primary glaucomas were the maximum. About 40% uh, were glaucomas which were primary, which were the best, which are the best actually to uh, amenable to treatment. But 55 of them were non-acquired. So it's important to know that, that you're not just dealing with a glaucoma which is going to get better with time. And acquired glaucomas were quite a bit. 42% acquired, which means trauma, uveitis, surgery, tir kaman, ball, fist, fighting. So all that trauma comes in very, very, so, so you know, having protective glasses when the children go out, Diwali, Dashera, being careful, all of that is also important. And this is countrywide, so hopefully we'll be publishing it sometime soon. Coming to the surgery, um, this is something called angle surgery, which is the first thing we do for this sort of glaucoma. This is what primary congenital glaucoma is, large eyes. Um, a, a child which is about three or four months old, which is, and these are the best ones that, that we can hope for. And uh, so this is an, the, uh, the thing we did one after the other, and she is now completely normal. Um, sometimes one is not enough, you need to do two, so they come, you do one, you still see a little bit of haziness, you go in, you treat the rest of the angle. She is now three years old, absolutely normal vision. Um, so this is what the baby came with, and this is what the baby's become now. Um, this two-week-old baby, you need to think of what to do. So this is something called acute high drops in one eye, where the sudden rise of pressure and the water has fluid has come into the cornea and made it white. So, but the other eye, the cornea was clearer, even though there was glaucoma and the pressures were high. So we did combined trap with trap. That's a surgery for the right eye and a goniotomy, which is a surgery for the left eye. And at one month post-op, you can still see there's some congestion in the right eye because it's a much more uh, uh, much more extensive surgery that we do compared to just one goniotomy where the eye is clear. So just to illustrate that if you know what they have, the treatment is tailored to what is best for the baby. Uh, the goniotomy has worked well so far, so we are okay with uh, doing goniotomies, which is what we go inside the eye and we, we treat it from the inside rather than from the out. When the cornea is very hazy, this is the uh, kind of surgery we do, uh, combined trap with trap. I think I'll st I'll skip the surgical steps. Um, extremely gratifying in neonatal onset glaucoma, which has traditionally been a very dismal prognosis uh, disease. Uh, this kid is now six years old, absolutely normal, goes to school, but she's one of the earliest that came to us when she was actually 16 hours old. She was born in PGI on the evening before, and the next morning she was in my clinic. So this is one of the earliest that we've done but she's doing all right. So once surgery is done, is it over? I mean, what next? It's all very hunky-dory. So when to call back, how to evaluate, what if it progresses despite IOP controlled, and even if the disease stabilizes, what beyond the intraocular pressure? So the first thing is, when is the, when is the eye patch uh, opened? If it's bilateral surgery, it's four to six hours in the recovery room by the time another three, four children are done. We go and open up the first one. And you can see how troubled the child looks because uh, when the pressures are high, there's corneal edema, there's something called photophobia. They can't look into the light too well, so that she doesn't like the camera's light. And after surgery, you can see within four hours how the cornea clears. So these, these red marks are, are due to me, due to the speculum, which might have been a little too tight. So that's a little bit of trauma in the lid, which will heal. But the cornea is clear very, very, very soon. So that's very gratifying if we have bilateral surgery. And uh, what next? What do we do after that? Six to eight weeks. Again, a troubled, unhappy soul. But by the time they come back to us in six weeks time, she's ready to look through me, uh, look at me through the slit lamp. And the mother is the best person to ask that. Is she better? Do you think she looks at you? Do you think the corneas are better? If possible, we take the intraocular pressure using uh, separate uh, instruments. And then we also look at the axial. And so this is the instrument we use to check pressures. That's in a newborn baby there. And this is when the children are a little older in their mother's lap. They're perfectly fine to let you. It's called an eye care or a rebound tonometer. So that has really, really helped us rather than having to take them on into the OR, giving them general anesthesia, and then taking the pressure. So now we can take the pressures in the clinic reliably. Axial length or the, or the length of the globe, that's important. So it's important to understand that a baby's eye is like a balloon. And what happens is uh, when the pressure, because it's elastic, so when the pressure increases, 
the eyeball increases. So like a balloon, if you press on a balloon, even though you are inflating it, it doesn't appear very hard. Whereas an adult's eye is like a football. So you just press, uh, you fill it in air and it feels hard. So that's what the adult's eye is like. So the baby's eye, your pressures that you measure might be normal, but if you haven't measured the growth of the globe or the length of the eye, which is called the axial length, you'll miss, you'll miss the fact that the pressures are uncontrolled. So that's something that we've learned. Um, this is a boy who's come with, you see how enlarged the globe is, come to us late, it's called late onset PCG, but look at the right eye compared to the left. So the, the eye really enlarges like a balloon in the effects of the uh, intraocular pressure. So, for instance, this preterm baby, his ROP, that's another disease, another story altogether, retinopathy of prematurity. Anyway, so the surgery was done and post-surgery, the surgeon noticed that the globe was enlarged, but what our ROP surgeon said that we kept taking our uh, eye care pressures, but the pressures were fine until we noticed that the eye is really, really large. And uh, we we do this graph, this is from our clinic of this baby. And when we plotted the axial lengths over time, you can see this was normal. It's like a pediatrician's normal growth curve. You see where it went up. So the pressures were not recorded high, but the eye kept getting larger and larger before they referred it to us. And we did a CTT or we did a surgery. The corneas also cleared and actually the growth then flattens out. So, so this is just to illustrate that glaucoma in a child is not equal to intraocular pressure control but you need to look at many, many other things. The other thing is recognition of the risks of general anesthesia. So there is cognitive decline noticed if you give too much of GA in a very small baby. So we've considered using sedation, using dexmetidomidine, and uh, now we don't really need to give general anesthesia for examining children unless we need to take out a suture or do some procedure where this is not possible. So um, after successful surgery, again, is our job done? So this, this little baby came many, many, many years ago and had a rather angry expression. Most of the babies are a little angry when I uh, shine a camera and take their pictures. So, But he remained a little unhappy. So we called him our angry young man. And uh, at three years, he was a little angry. At seven years, he was a little angry. He's come now after COVID. He's a 17-year-old strapping young guy, and he still doesn't look very happy. This time when I put him on the slit lamp, these are ruptures in the cornea which are running right through the center of the pupil. So he can't see, he can see, he's 6'6", six, six, but the quality is not too great and he's always straining. And I've asked my cornea colleagues and they said, 6'6", six, six, you think I'm going to touch this cornea? Maybe I'll send it over to Murli to do something about it or Dr. Prashant can do something. What do you do with just linear things in the center of the pupil which are absolutely clear and everything is fine and pressures are 6-6, six, six, but the boy is still an angry young man. So what do you do with him? So that's something which we need to think about what to do. Now, beyond the pressures, don't forget vision. So that's something if the mother, if the child with his spectacles is looking and laughing at the mother, obviously they're able to see. So for us, retinoscopy, spectacle prescription, visual acuity assessment, even in children, we can do that the access assessment, whether the light going in through the pupil is actually hitting the retina or not, amblyopia treatment, which is patching a weaker eye, so the, uh, a better eye so that the weaker eye can see, and visual fields whenever they come. So that's, that's very, very important. So there's much beyond the intraocular pressure. You see this, we've done surgery in a baby. There's persistent corneal scar. You get a corneal transplant done. That is what management is, not leaving the baby blind in one eye even if the pressure is controlled. And sometimes you need to take hard decisions. So when you have something called Peter's anomaly like this, you have everything which is stuck in the cornea. You know it's going to be difficult surgery. We let the cornea guys figure out what they want to do with it. But in the meanwhile, don't wait. So there's a small central scar. Just do an optical iridectomy to let the light in and let the child see by the time the corneas come or the, we aren't as fortunate as Edri Prasad where the transplants or the eyes are concerned because we have to wait for voluntary donations and sometimes that gets very, but the point is don't let the child wait, do something for the child so that the vision is restored at least. So then even if IOP is controlled, cornea clear, the disc is healthy, is our job done then? So visual rehabilitation is quite, is another, uh, another thing completely. 
So remember, even after good vision, the large eye can have very high myopia. And if you have myopia in one eye, that's the nightmare. So the contact lenses don't stay in place. What can we do? Spectacles, it's just too heavy on one side. They can't have a minus 20 on one and nothing on the other. So do we remove the natural lens and put in an IOL? Or do we just put in another lens on the natural lens? So there are all things that I've done. This is a small video where my, um, this is actually shot by my optom on his camera because I would keep sending it to him that she's now a big girl, but she has minus 17. Why don't you give her a contact lens? And he shot this and said, how can I give her a contact lens? There's a bleb, which means the surgery that we do has a little filter so that the water comes out of it. And no contact lens fits. I've tried everything, the scleral skirt, a central rigid lens. The minute she blinks and something, patak, the thing pops out. So it's not easy to just tell the optom, uh, put in a contact lens and you're not, you're not able to do it. So I'll just give examples. So this uh, was unilateral. This is called Bufthalmos, which is a large eye. So about uh, 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 lost to four years, but myopia of minus 22. And the vision is about 660. So uh, for him, what we did was took out the natural lens, which I hate to do in a child, but this natural lens was taken out and a minus two diopter lens was put in instead of that. Seven years old, he was patching his six nine, and now he the patching has stopped. He's become he's ten, but he has normal vision with no glasses. So that's one thing because he has a minus two lens which is inside the eye, even though we've taken out. But remember, the natural lens has uh, has a function, so he has no accommodation. He needs to use a plus three glass for the rest of his life to see for near, and there's always a risk because it's a large eye of peripheral retinal detachment or retinal tears when you do something like this. So trying to preserve the lens, uh, something that we did, another unilateral, you see that the, that's what a unilateral myopes glass looks like. It's so heavy that you can't really do anything, anything about it. Uh, you need to do something beyond giving them spectacles and contact lenses are difficult in children. So uh, the surgery was done, you can see again late onset but the cornea cleared. But then uh, we did something smart, and this is, I acknowledge Professor Jagat Ram for this. Can I have the video run? Yeah. All the so while this is something called an ICL, which was custom, yeah, customized. It's an implantable columnar lens, which means the lens, the contact lens is actually inside the eye on the natural lens. So it's put on the natural lens, and it opens up and unfolds. And uh, this child actually was without contact lenses or without spectacles and without anything else simply because the contact lens was within the eye, the natural lens was in place, he had accommodation and the risks of detachment and all that in a large eye were also taken care of. Um, just in the last couple of minutes, I'll just, again this is, okay. So uh, sometimes babies do have a life, so uh, this is something called Peter's anomaly where there's a large defect in the cornea and the entire lens is up there and that's where we see the lens. Of course, the pressures were also high. So we did the surgery, but it's an unsightly blind eye. And sometimes you need to tell the parents that, look, you know that this child is never going to see in this eye, but do you need the whole world to be pointing fingers and the child is going to be um, uh, not, not happy with this and uncomfortable? So a hard decision is to give them an ocular prosthesis with evisceration. But then he started going to school and the child is so much better. So rather than give them an unsightly, painful blind eye, it's maybe a good idea to just give them an ocular prosthesis and let them be happier and live their life as much as they can. So we aren't always heroes. Um, every day may not be good, but there's something good in every day. So that's, that's something which keeps us going. And I'll just share another small story, this, uh, this baby, we did surgery, this is next day, he was fine, called him back six weeks back, all hunky-dory, routine steroids, so especially for the postgraduate sitting here, there's no such thing as routine in medicine, you never know what routine becomes unroutine. Six weeks later, this is what happens, and he gained two kgs. We were shocked. We said, what did, what, what? and the mother was so happy. Haan, ji, tandurust ho hai. Nahi. <laughs> she, he's not tandurust, he's not, he's, he's sick, he's this is not normal. And we realized that she had been, we of course give steroids in both eyes because you've done both eye surgery. But if you're not going to instill or tell the mother that you need to occlude the puncta, you know, punctal occlusion so that this fluid doesn't go into the, into the nose and doesn't get, uh, absorbed within the system. 
So she was merrily putting three, four drops as they do and just leaving the baby there and all that, that steroid was staying there and going in and in and maybe it was an overdose, maybe what, but anyway, it was diagnosed as iatrogenic Cushing's and had to be treated, investigated. So what you need to do if ever this happens, you give a maintenance dose of hydrocortisone 3 milligram because you need to suppress the adrenal cortex thing, whatever has happened there. Uh, stress dose of hydrocortisone before the next EUA. So under treatment, two months later, the weight was okay. We breathed a little better. Moon face is settled. Parameters were normalized. And at six months, finally, the weight is appropriate for age. And the steroids have been gradually, the systemic steroids have been tapered. The hydrocortisone is out. And then we got a genetics. And this baby had a USP uh, 11 gene. Now, USP 11 is the same family as a USP 8 gene which is implicated in, uh, in Cushing syndrome, in de novo Cushing syndrome. So when we ask the geneticist, we don't really know, it's not been reported, but this is something to keep in mind that if you have an abnormal <coughs> sorry, response, just look that there must be a problem somewhere because we do bilateral surgery day in and day out. No baby comes to us like this. So this baby did have a USP 8, mut uh, 11 mutation and I, maybe, maybe that is uh, also one of the reasons why he was more susceptible. So word of caution, <coughs> sometimes no glaucoma treatment is required. These are some babies who all come to us to the glaucoma clinic, but they don't have glaucoma, they have other diseases. So we must know what we are doing. The real lessons are patience and hope and gratitude. And I always tell the babies, you teach me so much. And I'll just end with the, if this video will run. This is a fellow with CPA. No, it's not running. Anyway, so this was a baby with CPA, just uh, gave plus 10 glasses and he's roaming around our clinic and beating on the stools and being happy. But sometimes you just need to do nothing. <clears throat> to summarize, uh, it's a lifelong disease as all other glaucomas, but it can manifest in myriad forms. So much is unknown, but ensuring good vision is as important as IOP control. And we need to hold these children's hands for a long, long time. It's not just that they've come to us. This is the Pediatric Glaucoma Society. Um, it's dedicated to preventing and treating all aspects of childhood glaucoma because we believe that every child matters. And I love this quote. The question is not whether we can afford to invest in every child. The question is whether we can afford not to. We can't afford not to invest all we have in every child that comes to us. And I thank you. And this is also goes out a big thank you to all my residents who work painstakingly hard. And the madness goes on, we hope. Thank you. Thanks a lot. The privilege. Wonderful stories that you were telling. So we can take some questions if you have any. <laughs> Difficult topic to ask the question. I've seen a video on the net about a girl or baby, one year old or something, and she can't see there's some problem. The parents put on glasses, green glasses, and then she recognizes the mother's voice and she smiles. And is it so fast the effect? I don't know. Well, Do you if believe? it is, if the problem is of a refractive error. If mm. the problem is of glasses, then if yeah. you get the glasses, then they'll be yeah, seen. Because it, it, it's supposed yeah. to be blind, but suddenly when you look at the mother, yeah. recognizes the voice. This is so happy. So I thought that. So something. refractive errors are the single largest cause of blindness, actually, also, except that it's preventable or, or treatable blindness. So childhood glaucoma is a non treatable mm. blindness. But yeah, if you have large refractive errors, you give them glasses, I suppose they would be better. <laughs> Heredity also plays a role. Yes, absolutely. Heredi yeah, yeah. Hereditary plays a large role in, in all it, congenital. Is it preventable or uh, lifelong problem? Um, once, it, is a, it is a genetical problem. Yes, once the glaucoma has happened, you can't prevent it. But we are hoping that someday we'll have something called a gene therapy. So right now with the genetics, what we uh, are trying to find out is which is the gene which is responsible. Yeah. And once you know which is the gene that is responsible, someday there is gene therapy. It's come for other diseases like a Leber's congenital amyloid, LCA. But it's very, very expensive. But uh, it alters the function of the gene so that uh, it someday, I hope, will be curable. But there is a hope. But there is hope. It, uh, yes, absolutely. Make the parents happy. What is important, sir, I think, with the genetics is that to give effective counseling to the parents. 
So like this family, if I had genetics of the first girl and it was homozygous, which means both parents carry one, which I have today, and I tell them, if they have the first child, I tell them, listen, adopt another one. You know, so don't. Early age or middle age or old age, any factor is there linked to the genetic? Depends on the genetic, uh, on the thing. So you have something. This one is CYP1B1. This is the gene where the uh, glaucoma comes in small children. You have something called myosilin, MYOC, yeah. which comes in young adults. So you have juvenile open angle, 20s, right. 30s, right. and you have other genes which come in primary open angle glaucoma even later. So the onset of disease depends on which gene is affected. What I am told that at the stage of 30, 40, operation is not possible, only eye drops can be up. Uh, the, no, uh, uh, it depends on the disease. Uh, well, I have uh, you know, friends like, uh, not like you, <laughs> but friends uh, in the academic circle, yeah. there I interact with the subject also, though I, it's not my subject. Yes, so if you have a glaucoma, who uh, a person who's 30 years old, whose glaucoma is controlled on drops, yeah. we probably would say that you don't require surgery now, but you put the drops and as long as your disease is stable, because surgery in these uh, young adults is also very complicated. So we would say that you put the drops now and in case it doesn't work or maybe lasers don't work or something, then we do offer surgery. But as long as the disease can be controlled in drops in older adults or older people, we don't do surgery. But for children, drops is not the answer. For babies, we need to do surgery as the, as the treatment. Usually both, but it can be asymmetric. It could be in one eye today, but that's what we tell the parent that the other eye looks all right. But we have to keep them under follow-up. Many times it may manifest a year or so later. So that's called asymmetric. It doesn't need to be. But usually what we see when they're very small children, then both eyes are affected usually together. It's the same uh, thing. Yeah. This is a different world completely. Yeah? Yes. We feel blessed. You know, we have all perfect hands, perfect eyes. Yes, perfect. yes. I and think I think so. we should re realize that and bless True. us as well. True. I think being, for you know, every doctor who works with children, we are so, so thankful for having normal, healthy children. Yeah, that's what the, it's amazing. You know, we yes. Be grateful for that. Yes, that's the, absolutely. Yeah. Anything can be uh, prevented in any medicine which should be taken or? Not that I know of, sir, as yet, that anything that prevents congenital glaucoma, um, if, the, if there is a genetic predisposition or something has gone wrong, basically it's a that's developmental, special. it's a developmental problem. The eye has not developed normally. <clears throat> so normally you have something called the trabecular meshwork that drains fluid out of the eye. It's like a chalni and that is blocked. So no amount of medication given before can sort of stop that development happening. So because it's a problem in development. I have a question. Yes. Some children are born blind, like yes. one of our relatives, I yes. mean, my mother's cousin. He was born blind and that was 70 years ago. But uh, what is the cause of being born blind? So ma'am, um, depends on which part of the eye. I mean, there's so many reasons both, for being. Yes. I mean, he was born blind. Yeah. So there's something called, you know, you can have microphthalmos, microcornea, where the eye just hasn't mm -hmm. developed. You have diseases of the optic nerve. You have so, so many. I mean, it's so huge, ma'am, that, you know. It means that say, they, those true. days, it will, not, it will not much develop. True. Of course, it could be glaucoma as well. There's no question about that. But, but I heard never, that he yeah. just, he was born completely blind. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. but those yeah. days, it was not so progressed. Uh, yeah, it was not progressed and... Uh, and it may not have been glaucoma, ma'am. There are so many yeah. other reasons. The eye may not have been developed. It might have been a... Uh, Badly developed optic nerve or something. So anything, anything could be. An so. accident can also cause a glaucoma. Yes, trauma in children uh, with anybody. Accidents. So again, the, any part of the eye which is supposed to drain out fluid, if that part is damaged, whether by accident, whether by surgery, those are called acquired glaucomas, where the person wasn't born with glaucoma but has acquired it because of a condition later. Sometimes inflammations, many inflammations of the eye, uveitis we call it, that might cause glaucoma. Steroids may cause glaucoma. Somebody who is completely normal and uh, is susceptible. So there are 5% there are of the population are steroid responders, which means their intraocular pressure rises exponentially when you put in steroids. 
steroid induced glaucoma is a huge problem in children one of the biggest causes of acquired glaucoma is that which is why our message always is, is do not ever put unmonitored steroids so don't use it for allergies and that percent of acquired glaucoma is very complicated yes 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 waiting here come on very bad yes. worse was that peer command business so you are telling acquired you know acquired percent and it happened in adults also or yes yes of course in adults also so you can have a damage with trauma with anything accidents you know age related Yes, sir. If the primary glaucoma that we usually see are age-related, it happens after forty years of age. So that's why we say when you have glasses for near, you should get your pressures checked and your discs seen as well. So those are the primary glaucomas. Primary open-angle glaucoma or angle closure happens at at older ages after forty years. If somebody has a BP or sugar, <coughs> he's likely to get glaucoma. Uh, there isn't any um, hard evidence to say that. but people with lower bp would also have lower blood supply of the optic nerve and they are prone to things called normal tension glaucoma where there is glaucoma so the optic nerve is damaged but the pressure is not high so that's one association but with uh, diabetes on the other hand glaucoma can occur as a complication so if you have vessels that have grown into the eye and then you have something called a neovascular glaucoma so that glaucoma is there but otherwise primary glaucoma is there is no hard evidence that there is an association as well but diabetes uncontrolled in the eye can cause a very very severe type of glaucoma called neovascular glaucoma that can happen there is a case of the cricket player nawab of patawdi i am just referring to it because he lost one eye in a car accident yes could it have been repaired or what nothing you know anything about it <laughs> it's a long road yes but i'm just asking you corneal transplant in time yeah, maybe those days it's about time. 50 years back so. retinal detachment sir was yeah. usually a dismal thing nowadays microsurgical retinal thing is so much more but even 25 years ago uh, complex ah. retinal detachments usually meant end of vision now there is no question one question yes it's a costly operation this can no be, uh, can no. be manageable by the middle class families yes yes absolutely no <laughs> nothing required <laughs> we are we are very very cost effective <laughs> no, no, yeah yeah you can institute like this okay but uh, you know, no no otherwise also otherwise. you need a uh, surgeon who is willing to do <laughs> it and you need a knife <laughs> Rotary, Rotary has to sponsor IPGs. Yeah. Yeah. Indian Pediatric Glaucoma Society. We are looking for. They're very bad. <laughs> Openly saying that. Mm, I know one case. Yes, sir. Child is of blindness by birth. Okay. Boy was about fourteen years old, and nobody treated. So he is blind. Yeah. That's the sad part, sir. We have. But then. Yes, yeah, sir. Then brought to me. What I'm a dental surgeon. I said. Go to the Saroni Hospital Haan. and I introduce him to the superintendent of the hospital. Acha. And they have operated him for cataract, oh, okay. and he could see. Yes. And yes, they were so imagine. happy, they were yeah. touching the feet of him. Yeah, I know. So simple God. cataract, yeah. and the boy was treated as blind for 14 years. Yes. So some of these children who come to us late, it's <clears> so sad that. दिखाया नहीं. What are you doing since five years, seven years? You're sitting at home. You don't know. No, we went. And they said that let the child grow up, then <laughs> then you get treated. Are uh, right? so this is also there. That that is, what do you mean? Lots <laughs> of taboos things, attached yeah, to it. I think so squint, things, yes. squint. They say treat it, but some people say no, it's a lucky sign or something. I've heard so many cases. <laughs> some you know, it's uh, I don't know. It's, uh, yeah, Dr. Mandel, sir, you have to say something. Three blinds are discussed. Very excellent. And I have a last lecture. question. So with all the work that you are doing, what is uh, I wouldn't say one. The challenge that uh, you feel it's difficult to overcome, or some more work needs to be done in managing the pediatric problem. I think the visual rehabilitation. For me, that is the most challenging thing. Whether it is refractive errors, corneas, uh, and the unexplained angry young man, I don't know what to do with him. So every time I see, the more I see. Uh, i think sirisha with you and i and sir and most of us getting the pressure down is not such a big deal anymore but i think getting them into visually uh, productive people is to me that's the greatest challenge thank you thank you so much
extremely extraordinary lecture. Thank you. 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 Thank you